We have a long history with the Subaru WRX. It's been around forever, and at the beginning of our show, especially the beginning of our podcast, it felt like the answer to everything. Many people would ask us, guys, I want an all-wheel drive sedan, something that does it all, turbocharged, manual, something inexpensive, new or used. We recommended WRXs so much that we got sick of talking about them. And then Subaru got rid of the STI, the high performance model, and they got rid of, more importantly, the hatchback, which made it all the more usable. And we're left with just a WRX sedan, which misses an opportunity. And if the WRX is the classic recipe, the GR Corolla is certainly the challenger. And we're lucky that this Corolla and that WRX are almost a perfect match in every way you can think of. You could step up to other versions of the WRX, you could step up to other versions of this, but the truth is, unless you go for the Marizo, mechanically, this core GR Corolla with the limited set of differentials is the same as the circuit. So do you need to spend extra money? These two are the better buys. You want the WRX Premium, and you want the GR Corolla Core, which is this, with the front and rear LSDs, those Tours and Limited Slips. All the cool fins and everything you're thinking of, that's all from the dealer after the fact anyway, so why not just get a core and make it look cool? So here this is within about $1,000 of what it would cost you to get that exact WRX. The WRX Premium versus the GR Corolla Core. And I'm going to argue that both of these base cars are the ones to buy. Great cars, great roads, and all the reasons we love to drive. Road trips, comparisons, test drives, and podcasts. This is Everyday Driver. Now, I know some of you were saying, isn't there an updated WRX? And there is. This is not the TR model. The TR model used to mean, back in the 2000s, tuner ready, which meant base stripped out. We're just giving you the guts. You make it your own. Now it's come back as the second highest trim. In fact, that one will cost you over $42,000. This is the second from the base model. But through all of the trim levels, this being the premium trim level, which is one up from the base, including the new WRX TR, there's not a power bump. There's no more power. You still get a manual transmission, which is great. We like the manual but only on the GT can you find the different modes and also variable torque distribution. That's right, Subaru has refused to build an STI. They have the GT at the top end, which we've driven with the CVT. I think if you combine the TR with the GT, that spells STI, but what do I know? The suspension got revised to be 5% stiffer, 5%. I'm not sure you're gonna feel that and it really wouldn't change the performance dynamics. The thing that would is they're now offering the highest performance tire ever on the TR. We wouldn't be using that anyway. So the only benefit we'd actually get is the huge Brembo brakes that are now offered on that car. So I maintain that the better buy is still the premium model because you do get that 50-50 split. You get the same power. You can add the brakes that you want. You can do the suspension your own way. Well, if you're gonna do it yourself, there's no point in buying a TR model. You should buy the premium. This one is just under $38,000. We're running full winter tires. We're out here on one of the last gasps of winter that we have here in the Park City area. And this car is just fun. In fact, being in winter conditions makes it a little bit more fun. And this has a mystique. Every time we've driven the GR Corolla, it's like, oh, we get to drive the GR Corolla. I'm so excited. It has this mystique that Toyota has created around it that does not exist for the new WRX. And the total price of it is about $38,000. And you can get these base models for MSRP. In fact, some people are even getting them for less. And it doesn't drive any different than a circuit. Three cylinders? What on earth? A 1.6 turbocharged three-cylinder. The three pipes on the rear will remind you 300 horsepower here, 273 pound-feet of torque, which is more than both of the WX's numbers, and this weighs a little over 3,200 pounds, actually just under 33, which makes it almost 200 pounds lighter than the WRX. And the reality is you feel all of those numbers all the time. This feels lighter on its feet, it feels more ready to go, it feels like it has more power more of the time, which is fascinating when you consider the fact this is that little tiny 1.6 liter three-cylinder engine and it's such a high-stressed engine, I'm continually wondering 
at what point these engines are going to blow up. But you know what? I have to trust Toyota. I have to trust their engineering. There's a lot of boost pressure going through this engine to make more than the WRX. This is about a half second faster, zero to 60, but the truth is at any place in the rev band, this feels more powerful and ready to go than the WRX does. Okay, perfect opportunity. Full power. That's quick. But the shifter feel, this is better than the WRX. I mean, look, we all win because it's a manual transmission. The engagement is superior here. I can heel tow myself or I could use the IMT, Intelligent Manual Transmission button that's right here by the steering wheel. It actually works great. There's, there's really nothing wrong with it. The Toyota has rev match, which is brilliant and a lot of fun, but, but I like to have it off. And I like that Toyota lets me have it off. It feels like it's been engineered to have a race feel rather than the WRX trying to just go far enough. This goes all the way for me. Everyday Driver is brought to you by PowerStop. Brake upgrades made easy. It has also occurred to me that in this dual car review, you will not find a turbocharged inline four. That's right, because it's the Boxer 2.4 liter with 271 horsepower, 258 pound-feet of torque. Those are both solid, good numbers, and they're almost into STI territory when they used to make an STI version of this car. Good amount of power does not leave you lacking, but I never feel like it wants to rev as easy as the Corolla does. You have to kind of convince it more. See right there, between three and 4,000, that's where it makes solid power. And the power in this car is linear. All the other WRXs felt very light switchy to me. The turbo was completely asleep, or it was in full excitement mode. It was full race mode. This one is tuned for a little bit more linear power delivery. I like that. It's got good power and you can definitely extract it out of the motor, but it's just not as playful or as hummingbird-like as the one in the GR Corolla. And here's the power. That's good. That's really good. It's still there. And the shifter, it's a manual. This shifter is not as good as the one in the Corolla. The actual handle itself is higher, the throws are longer, it's not as precise. In spite of this not being one of the better ones on the market, I'm just thankful to have it at all. Heel and towing is so satisfying in this car. This is WRX weather here. Greasy, bad visibility, bring it. One of the big reasons that Subaru is so successful with the WRX is because of weather, and we have the perfect day to do it in. Subaru is making something that's rare in the market. Most of the all-wheel drive systems out there on affordable cars are front-wheel drive biased and no fun at all. This is fully symmetrical and actually can be made to have fun. Here you get that center hydraulic clutch pack and 50-50 torque distribution. It's that Subaru symmetrical all-wheel drive. But on those old STIs, you remember the driver control, center diff control? You could control the diffs to change the handling of the car. That was the magic. These Subarus were known for the changeable center diff, that thing that the Corolla now has. You can't get that on any of these now unless you buy the top trim WRX, the GT. It's not even available on the TR. Otherwise, you're left with Subaru's great symmetrical all-wheel drive system, but no limited slip differentials at all, front or rear. So performance technology-wise, this is definitely a step behind the GR Corolla. I've always felt the WRX is so brilliant because you can just chuck it in and steer with the power. That's all I think about when I associate WRX with cornering. It's never about steering. It's always been steer with your right foot. Now, speaking of steering, this is a 13 and a half to one, which is decent. That's a quick steering ratio. I feel like the all-wheel drive system has always been the Achilles heel that deadens the steering feel, but it's got precision. The WRX is a car with an anti-social reputation. It's the brawler, it's the uncouth kid's car in reputation. However, among these two, this is the nicer place to be. It actually has more sound deadening, so it's not as loud as it is at freeway speeds in the GR Corolla. It has a halfway decent stereo. The one in the Corolla is terrible. In bad weather, I don't think twice in this car. It's just easy to get in and go and be comfortable and heated seats, which the Corolla doesn't have all the technology you want in a modern car and a little bit of performance as well. The ride quality here 
is still the better one to get. The suspension is not rough, but on some portions of the road, it's almost, which tells me it's just stiff enough. This has a two inch longer wheelbase than the GR Corolla, if you can believe it. It seems like this is the much bigger car, but the back seat is where this car wins. If you're needing that do-it-all car, the good news is the WRX is still great for that. 15 years ago, the WRX was kind of the only game in town. It was really the only car that people were picking in this market segment. Now it has other competition and it's lost the hatchback and it's lost the STI. I wonder how much longer Subaru will make this car. I'm glad they do and we need to buy them if we want to keep them around. We've rounded off the uncouth parts of the WRX and we've brought it more in line with everything else in Subaru's lineup. Now you could argue that's an improvement, but you lost a little bit of fun in the process. Nothing informs us of a car's dynamics like switching seats immediately. Because instantly, this car feels more alive and raw and like instant fun. When you're talking the same money, the big difference between the WRX and this Corolla is where the money went. This has more mechanical goodies and actual high performance stuff than the WRX does. This has limited slip differentials front and rear and it has that center diff that is overdriven that allows you to actually change the torque split. Don't you wish the Subaru had the switch, that driver control switch? Well, here it is in the GR Corolla, and it'll tell you on your instrument panel, 60-40. You can switch to 30-70, throwing 70% 70 of the torque to the rear, and then if you push it, it goes into track mode. I haven't even gotten to the drive modes yet, and no, this does not have adjustable dampers, but in sport mode, this car feels instantly alive. Toyota has accomplished this by a central gear that overdrives the rear and then they can move the torque around because the axles aren't being driven the same. That has created some issues. You probably heard about overheating of the all-wheel drive system in this and this car in the middle of a track day will default to a front-wheel drive car. There's no real consensus. This is an online discussion, but it seems to be that the exhaust is actually too close to the sensor that tells the diff when it's overheating. The thing you need to know is, yes, it exists, but it's not common outside of heavy track use. I don't want you to think that because of this system, it's always going to overheat and the diff is always a problem. It really isn't. If you're a person that can extract everything out of a car in the middle of a racetrack, that diff might overheat. And that is a bummer because this is a really great system and I love working with it and you can actually feel the difference. I personally like the 70-30 a lot. Here I am in winter conditions where I've actually preferred 50-50 the diffs are the sweet spot on this car. Because just like the Subaru can turn with throttle, you can do the same thing in the GR Corolla. You actually have more control and more choice. It has a quicker steering ratio than the WRX. The steering is not only faster here, but it feels better. There's not a lot of road information coming through on either one of these cars, but the way the weight shifts and the way you control it with the steering wheel, this is a more playful car to put into a corner and it always feels lighter. This thing rotates. On track, it's very apparent. But I feel like the WRX is a little bit more precise. I feel like there's, it's a little bit vague here. Now, I will say that while also saying this is on winter tires. I'm feeling the tread block squish more than I'm feeling a lack of precision. The best part of the rally breeding thing is that they've taken a base car and created magic with it. The money went into the mechanicals, and that means the interior here is a little cheap. In fact, it reminds me of the old Evo 10 from Mitsubishi, where there was tons of great technology there, but inside it felt like a cheap car. This Corolla is exactly the same. But I don't care that the interior is so base. It's what I asked for. Everyday Driver is brought to you by Grio's Garage. Use the code DRIVER10 for 10% off your order. Toyota did exactly what I wanted with the Corolla XSE, put wider fender flares on it, make it look like a rally car, make it more aggressive because the styling is actually better suited to wider fender flares, to making it look aggressive like this. Sure, I want the carbon fiber roof. I don't care that it's not here. I don't care that the spoiler is not here. I just like that enthusiasts will notice but everybody else will just kind of say, oh, it's just a little red hatchback. 
It's interesting to drive both these cars back to back when you know they cost the same, and both of them are under 40 grand. Because the interior of this Corolla is cheap. There's no way around it. There's, there's hard plastics here that aren't the best. In fact, sitting here, I wish I was in the WRX because even though those aren't the super awesome Mercaros that are available in the upper trim models, these seats aren't good enough. I really prefer the seats in the Marizo. These seats on the base Corolla and even the circuit Corolla, they need better adjustment, especially in the lumbar. I do wish for a little bit better seats, but these seats in the core grade very much match the premium grade seats in the Subaru because they almost squeeze me. They're almost supportive. They want to be more, but it's like the seats were told, do not support a little bit more because we have the bigger brother seats to sell. Because this is the very base model, these seats aren't even heated. And if I were going to buy this as a winter car, I would want to pay the extra to get the winter pack and get the heated seats. It does feel like Corolla. This green feels tacked on and I don't care. It doesn't feel like an expensive car and that's part of the charm. Actually, that's all of the charm. The back seat space is not great for anybody, maybe kids, but in the rear hatch, well, it's a hatchback. What do you want? So the hatch is surprisingly small, but at least you got a hatchback. It's dark in here. It's a sea of black plastic. There's no sunroof, but the visibility is fine. There's nothing problematic with this interior, but you don't get any frills. There's no extras. Of course, it does have all the safety features that Toyota's putting on everything. It actually has smart cruise control and lane keep assist. It will quasi drive itself like many of those systems will, which is surprising on a car that otherwise feels so decontented. Are we used to the styling yet? Are we all comfortable with the new WRX styling? I don't know that the Subaru WRX has ever been a car you'd call attractive, but it's always seemed really purposeful. And when this one came out with body cladding, which is the scourge of Subaru right now, a lot of us didn't like it. And I think it's aging okay, but I still wish it didn't have the body cladding. The wheel arches are the thing that you look at when you see the WRX. You see the side view, you see the wheel arches. Any view, really, all your eye goes to are the wheel arches. There's a lot to look at around the car. There's a lot of surface development, but everything about it is as aggressive as possible while still being sort of a family car. And that's what speaks to rally breeding, even though pretty much no WRX has had plastic cladding on their wheel arches before. However, it does speak to that. It speaks to this off-road, robust rally, all weather nature. And the more I look at it, the more I appreciate what Subaru has done, except it looks too tall to my eye. That rear three quarter, the C pillar, the proportion is too tall. But that's what we're left with. And because of that, we don't get a hatch. But the trunk is very good sized and the seats will fold down. Back seats in here have a little bit more leg room. Of course, you don't have a hatch. We can also all agree the interior needed a serious update. Subaru has added the center screen. It's useful, but it doesn't dominate. And I've noticed the redundancy here for research, for fan speed, for temperature control. You can tell that Subaru is focused on making models for everyone and not for the enthusiast, mainly because of this massive screen in here, which is very easy to use. It's a little bit slow sometimes. Settings. Ugh, get so tired of diving into the menus and waiting for the software to update. Okay. Nevertheless, I like what the aesthetic, the instrument panel does say Subaru now. This is now in every one of their models and it has become their standard system. Plus, of course, you've got eyesight and all the protections that Subaru wants to give you because they are pushing safety much more than performance at this point. Look at this, weather. Is the WRX not the car you want to be in for a day like today? But then there's the GR Corolla. We must consider that. Toyota has now created that halo, that mystique, that desirability, which I don't think a regular WRX has, or the GT or the TR. I don't think it has that deep desirability. In our effort to not talk about the WRX too much, I think we may have overlooked it a bit too much because this is still a fantastic do-it-all car. And I'm thrilled that Subaru continues to make it. This deserves to be a legend. It maintains its own status as a, okay, you want an affordable four-seat, all-wheel drive, do-it-all family sedan with a little bit of fun? WRX used to be, still is. The difference in driving fun, and I'm being picky to say this, is that WRX is willing to have any kind of driving fun you'd like, and the GR Corolla 
is excited. Isn't the point of these cars just to have fun? Isn't that the whole point of both of these manufacturers building them? There isn't a point in time where this car doesn't entertain you. And that is worth your dollars. That is why you should consider a GR Corolla. This is an interesting pairing of cars because I expected the GR Corolla to just walk away with this because there's no question this is the more fun car. But then I have to think about how is this going to be used and who is the person buying it? If you're buying a vehicle as your only car, a thing you're gonna drive in every possible condition and you can't afford another vehicle in your life at all, the WRX may be better because you're going to feel like you got more for your money in the cabin where you spend all your time. It's fun enough in any condition when you want to drive it. It's just not as fun as this. The perfect all-in-one enthusiast car is the GR Corolla. It's practical. It's a hatchback. It's got back seats. It's got a lot of power. It's got a weird engine. It's a manual and you can control how you go through a corner. No, the interior is not nice. It's just an interior. It covers up the crash structure in the HVAC and kind of separates you from the engine. That's really all the interior does. The GR Corolla is the winter car you want if you have another car in your life as well. I don't know that it's the car you want if it's the only car in your life. I think you're going to want it to be a little bit nicer than it is in here. I think you're going to want to feel like you got more bells and whistles for your money on the interior and you're going to want better seats. But if this is your fun winter runabout or your secondary car or you'd like a hatch that has some do it all and maybe you'll take it to the track, this is your answer. The problem is the Corolla is the one I want, but the WRX is the one you should actually buy. If you can't find a GR Corolla, this isn't a consolation prize. And if you want to buy a base version, you can get a WRX for significantly cheaper. This is a fantastic do everything one car garage. I feel like what you're trying to achieve by tuning a WRX is already available right here in the GR Corolla, the core with the LSDs. Give me the mechanicals that feel like I'm in control, like I'm mastering something. And this is the more fun car. It feels lighter all the time. I like the engine and gearbox much better than the one in the WRX. This definitely takes the WRX's slot as an all-wheel drive, do-it-all winter hatchback. Subaru is missing out by not offering that anymore. Wish we'd had this weather yesterday <laughs> when we shot all the B-roll. I'd kind of like to see the snow on camera, fly the drone through the snow. Yeah, that's in the outs, but it's true. It's true nonetheless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>